Hello and welcome to the Hard to Handle Sports Podcast. This is episode number 40. My name is Ismael San Juan. Thank you so much for being here. The NFL season is now 17 games long. They have added an extra game to the regular season. Records will be broken. Also, Roger Goodell says we will have full stadiums in 2021. Is that really a possibility? I'll give my thoughts on that. And are the Chargers going to sell their team to Jeff Bezos? Uh, I would be very excited if they did. I'll uh, break all of their drama down on this episode. And LaMarcus Aldridge plays his first game for the Nets. He looks solid. What does the signing of LaMarcus Aldridge mean to the Nets? And on a sad note, the U.S. men's national team failed to make the Olympics once again. They have not made it since 2008. All of this on this episode of the Hard to Handle Sports Podcast. Let's get started. The NFL season is now 17 games long, 18 weeks long. We're going to have 17 games starting the 2021 season. We have had 16 game seasons since 1978, but this is no longer the case. We are now playing 16 games. I think this is all about the money. Uh, All the money that was lost in 2021 because of the pandemic, because of not allowing fans into the arena. It has to be recouped some way. And the NFL has agreed to add an extra game to the regular season. They take one of the preseason games away, but preseason doesn't make as much money as regular season. And now we have 17 game seasons. So no more eight and eights, no more 12 and fours. Um, I know some players don't like it. I already saw Alvin Kamara spoke out on this or he tweeted something that he wasn't really in favor of this. And I get it. For the players, it means an extra game. It means an extra chance for you to get hurt, to put your bo- you put your body on the line for 16 games. I've heard it by numerous players that they say the last four to five games, the last quarter of the season is where it gets tough. You know, you're dragging your body to the finish line. Um, you're playing through injuries. You're not at 100%. No, no team is at 100%. Everyone's just trying to make it to the finish line. And if you're in the playoffs, then, you know, you have a goal. You have a Super Bowl goal. There's that motivation. But if you're one of those teams that doesn't make it to the end, that doesn't make the playoffs, that you pretty much know your season is done when the when the season's over. By week 12, you, you kind of know, all right, this is it. Like, I'm just trying to finish the season, stay healthy, and come back next season. That extra game just, it probably doesn't feel right. It's probably, it's probably going to feel long. It's just going to be another game that you're away from your family, but it is what it is. The NFL is about making money. It is a business, and adding an extra game to the regular season is going to bring a lot of profit to the NFL. As a fan, it's mostly positives. We get to see our favorite players for another game. We get to see our favorite teams for another game. We get to enjoy our fantasy football squads for another week. So it's for the fans, it's mostly a positive. You get another chance to see a game that has some meaning that actually counts. But for the players, uh, I'm pretty sure they're keeping the same game check. Like their their contracts are for the season. So they're not, I don't believe they're going to make extra money. So it's just an extra game where they could miss out on, on playoffs, where they're just missing out from their family. Another week of the grueling NFL schedule. So I get why some players would be opposed to it. One of the positives for players, um, if if they want to look at a silver lining, is that now there's more chances to be record holders. Because you have an extra game, because you have another game to go get stats, to go get numbers, records will be broken. I'm talking passing yards, rushing yards, touchdowns. Those are All these records are going to be broken just because now there's going to be an extra game. Um, the passing yards, I feel like that one's the easiest, the most likely to be broken. I believe Peyton Manning has the record with 5,500-ish yards. That's going to be broken. Um, I believe 5,000 yards is going to become the new 4,000. Before, it used to be uh, 4,000 yards was like a big achievement. If you were like a quarterback that would go over 4,000 yards, you were looked at as elite uh, like even like in the early when I started watching football in the early 2000s, middle 2000s, like Carson Palmer, all those players, they would throw over 4000 yards and they were looked as elite quarterbacks. And for a while, these last few years, we were in this kind of middle area where 5000 yards is still like a really big achievement. 
four thousand yards is just like the norm. But five thousand yards is not the norm. It's still looked at as a huge achievement. I think with this extra game, five thousand yards is now going to become the norm. It's not going to be looked at as impressive. It's going to be uh, just any like, oh, five thousand yards. All right, good for you. And now we're getting to the point where six. We're going to get close to six thousand yards. Where that's going to be like, oh, who's going to be the first one to get to six thousand? Um, we're becoming a passing league, so it makes sense. We're we're moving towards. A passing more and more of a passing NFL, so five thousand will be the norm. Also, I think the rushing yards um, in a single season is gonna get broken pretty soon. Maybe even next season. Um, if Derrick Henry would have had an extra game this season, he would have definitely broken the rushing yards record um, for a season. The touchdown ones, that's where it gets a little harder. LT has a record with twenty eight. And no one has really gotten close. I think Shady McCoy and LeGarrette Blunt are the ones that have gotten the closest. But there were still like eight, eight or at least eight touchdowns away from actually breaking the record. So I think that one's going to be a little harder. The receiving touchdowns, Randy Moss has it with 22. That one's a little harder. Maybe Devontae Adams, I believe he had 18 and 14 games last season. So maybe he, he could get to it with an extra, if he would have played those two games and now he gets an extra game. But... Records will be broken. Uh, you got to skew the records for 17 games. So that's one of the positives. If you're an NFL player, if you're one of the elite NFL players and you're kind of upset that you're going to play an extra game and that they're making the season longer, one of the positives is that you're going to have a higher chance of breaking a record if you're one of those elite players. If you're just a regular NFL player, middle of the pack, then maybe the 17-game season is just... Um, it's just another uh, another gruesome game that you have to play. But NFL games mean a lot, so you get another game to audition. I know preseason is usually for those bottom 10 r- roster spots, but I think uh, in those three games, people can still make enough impact to get noticed. But myself, I'm very excited f- to see the NFL go to 17 games. I think this is a natural progression. Um, I, I can see the NFL going to 18 games maybe in – the next 20 30 years but we'll see we'll see how it ends up going uh i'm very excited for this 17 game season it's just another opportunity to go to an nfl football game and i think that would be very exciting and speaking of going to nfl football games roger goodell says that we will have full stadiums in 2021 he's saying that by the beginning of next season which is in around five months september i believe we will have full stadiums Fans will be back at the stadiums, and that sounds great and all, but I think we gotta go. We gotta thread lightly. I mean, it's it's everything seems to be th- um, shifting gears right now. We're getting everyone vaccinated. Uh, the numbers are starting to go down. I believe they're shooting up a little bit right now, but for the most part, numbers are shooting down. We're getting vaccinated. Um, hopefully, by September. More and more people are vaccinated. Uh, that herd human- immunity is going full throttle. But nothing is for sure. We got to see how effective this vaccine is. By September, we will know more about it. Also, hopefully there's n- um, no new variants of COVID by then. Um, knock on wood, none of that happens. But I'm just pointing out different scenarios that could happen. But if the science permits it, if the science is there to back it up, I am all for it. I am very excited to go to an NFL game in 2021. Um, one of the things that the NFL has going for it, they, they keep putting this out. It says that in, in the limited capacity stadiums that they allowed in 2020, uh, their data shows that it resulted in no known significant cluster of infections in the surrounding community. So basically what they're saying, if I was, if I was to give an example, Green Bay... The Green Bay Packers were one of the stadiums that allowed um, limited capacity to their home, to some of their home games. It basically showed that like the Packers allowing fans to go to Lambeau Field showed no rise in infections of COVID in the surrounding area. So basically, the area around the stadium showed no increase of cases during those games, after those games, in the following months after those games. It, it just stayed like the same as any other area around there. So that's a good thing for the NFL. It just means that, you know, the limited capacity didn't have a bad effect on the community. So if we were to go full-fledged, full stadiums, then maybe, you know, now that we're vaccinated, 
it wouldn't have a bad effect on the communities either. I mean, if you guys watched the Super Bowl, I believe it was 40% capacity, but it looked it looked very full. It looked more than 40%. And I think Tampa Bay reported that their numbers kind of stayed the same. It, it showed no fluctuation. So that just keeps pointing positive signs that would lead me to assume that we will have full stadiums in 2021. And I know Roger Goodell is being optimistic. Uh, the NFL is known for playing hardball for not adjusting last season they didn't move their season they didn't shorten the season they just kept going props to them they were able to finish the whole season no games were canceled Uh, the infection rate in their players and their staff was very low so props to Roger Goodell for being headstrong and just moving forward it looked like it was going to be a tough decision people were questioning why the NFL didn't adjust hindsight tells us that you know they played it pretty well it was the right decision and now they're looking to 2021 to bounce back recoup that money that they missed out and have full stadiums so i'm excited i hope in september when the nfl season kicks off we're in a much better place hopefully the pandemic is behind us and we are able to go to games but if not um then you know you just gotta accept the fact that we're still in the pandemic it's gonna be a slow recovery and hopefully maybe mid-season around week eight week nine we're able to go to one of these games and really appreciate nfl football because even if even if i'm not lucky enough to go to a game um i would love to have fans back in the stadium because the atmosphere that they produce the atmosphere when you're watching a game on tv just can't be replicated and even if i'm not there even if i'm not one of the lucky ones to go i would love to have people in the stands just to get that environment going get the ambiance it's it brings me chills just thinking about it so hopefully roger goodell is correct hopefully we do have four stadiums in 2021 and if not by the beginning of the season at least by mid-season or playoffs or you know the last three four weeks when uh, all these games really matter a lot in other news the chargers might be forced to sell their team the los angeles times reports that d spanos one of uh, the late Alex Spano's daughter uh, wants to sell the team. She says that they're in, in a dire financial situation. And the only way to get out of this is to sell the team. Uh, Alex Spano's, the late Alex Spano's purchased 60% of the team for seven, $70 million um, way back when. And now he owns, they own 96% of the Chargers. And the four siblings control, um, control 15% of the team. That adds up to 60, and I believe the rest of the 36% is in the trust that D and Dean Spanos control. So basically, the trust has debt of over $350 million. That's what D Spanos Barbarian is reporting. And the only way to get out of that debt is to sell the team. Meanwhile, Alexandria, Michael, and Dean have said that they will not sell the team, that if D wants to sell, her 15% um, of the team, that they will buy it off of her and that the Chargers will not be changing ownership. It's just a wild situation. I don't know who to believe. We got to see how this story develops. If D is right, if she if she is correct about the Spanos fam- family being in a dire financial situation, then it might force them to sell the team. It looks like the brothers, the other siblings, do not want to sell the team. They're being stubborn or, I don't know, maybe uh, they're calling D a liar that they're not in a dire situation. We got to find out uh, who's telling the truth. But just from history, I would say that I would kind of believe D because the Spanos family has been kind of labeled as being cheap. Um, They were cheap uh, when San Diego offered them a deal to build a new stadium. They wanted the city to cover more of the bill. They were cheap uh, when it came to um re-signing players they it always looked like they weren't capable of signing their players to extensions i'm talking the late vincent jackson darren sproles michael turner sean phillips there was just numerous players cromarty it just looks like there was numerous teams players in the team that could have stayed with the chargers but because the spanos were cheap they they were let go and they found success with other teams so and, you know, they're cheap. They might be in dire financial situation. We'll see how this plays out. 
I myself am a San Diego native. I used to be a diehard Charger fans. I never got to go to a Charger game because, you know, money was tight when I was little, when I was in San Diego. But I was one of those people that would go to their offseason um, trainings. I would go to their little scrimmages with other teams. So I, I was invested with the Chargers. Um, not going to lie, they probably made, made me drop a tear or two growing up. But the thing that really killed my fandom for them was just seeing how much the Spanos family didn't care about San Diego, how they didn't really put an effort to stay in San Diego. Uh, they were chasing the money. They were chasing Los Angeles. And it, it didn't matter what San Diego offered them. Um, any deal that San Diego put on the table to to build a new stadium in San Diego was shut, shot down by the Spanos family. And because of that, because of that, it rubbed me the wrong way. And I just felt like I couldn't keep supporting a team that was ran by this family. So if this report is true, if the Spanos are really in, you know, cash strapped and they got to sell the team, I would be all for it. I, whoever comes in and buys that team, I would be, I'm a free agent fan right now. I would not be a free agent anymore. I would sign with the Chargers, and I would be a Charger fan again. So depending on who who the who the buyer is, my excitement level will be will range. But it is rumored that Jeff Bezos is one of those candidates that is looking to buy an NFL franchise, the richest man in the world. That would be crazy for the Chargers. I think just having Jeff Bezos as their owner would be a complete 180 for the Chargers. Jeff Bezos, the richest man alive. I know he was he will not hesitate to spend money. You would see the Chargers have the best training facilities, the best trainers, the best coaches. And I think it would be a good a good transition for the Chargers if it were to happen. Obviously, this might be a pipe dream. Like we don't know where this is going to end up with the Span Spanos family is D Spanos barbarian telling the truth. Um, it could just be family drama. You know how families sometimes just argue, sometimes just butt heads. We've all been there. I, I would I would imagine, but we gotta. I I gotta follow this story. This is definitely this definitely caught my attention, especially as an ex Charger fan. Um, this is one of those stories that I was like, whoa, are the Spanos really gonna be forced to sell their team? Like this is definitely something we gotta keep an eye on. What do you guys think? Do you guys think the Chargers are gonna sell the team, or is this? Is this too good to be true? If you're a Charger fan, you know, I, I can imagine most Charger fans would want the Spanos to, the Spanos family to sell the team. It's kind of like how most um, Washington football teams fans want Dan Snyder to get to sell the team. Uh, I believe most Charger fans want the Spanos families to to change to change ownership to to sell the team. So let me know what you guys think. Is you guys think this is gonna happen? You you think uh, D Spanos Barbarian is telling the truth? Or do you think, uh, you know, this is all just smoke and mirrors and nothing's going to happen? You know, it's just another story in the offseason that's going to get lost in the next two weeks and we forget about it. Or is there some legs to this and uh, the Chargers really going to change ownership? Are we going to say the Amazon Chargers? Let me know. Let me know what you guys think. Personally, I think there might be some truth to this, but I don't know if anything big is really going to happen. Like, it might just... It might just be that the Spanos, the other Spanos siblings, just end up buying a uh, D Spanos Barbarian uh, portion of the team. I think that's the most realistic option. And then, but hopefully, hopefully they have to sell, if I'm being honest. But changing topics from the NFL, let's talk a little NBA. LaMarcus Aldridge plays his first game for the Nets. Um, he didn't have a huge stat line. He's old. He's 35 years old. We know he's not the same LaMarcus Aldridge from Portland or his first few years with San Antonio, but he's still very savvy. Um, the fact that he played under Pop with San Antonio lets me to believe that he is a team player. He's going to give it his all every every night. He's a savvy veteran. He could score. He could still score in that 18-foot range. He, he still has... That fadeaway jumper, silky smooth. Um, I saw him get some buckets like that last night against the Hornets. So he can still score some points, but they don't really need him for that. They have a lot of scorers. They have a lot of stars. I think he's just a very good veteran presence. Lamarcus Aldridge. He's been an All Star numerous times. He's re he's respected. Uh, um, he's respected in the league by his peers. 
He's just been in the league for a while. He's 35 years old. He's he's made all stars. He's had huge games in the playoffs. So I think he's a good voice for the locker room. When you have like Kyrie, Harden, um, KD, you have um, Blake Griffin. Having Lamarcus Aldridge there, 35 years old, to really he's kind of like a jail guy. He's like a really good jail guy that has a lot of cachet. You know, if if he says something, he has a he has a resume to back him up. Whereas Younger players won't really question him. They won't really, like, fight back and be like, who who are you? Why are you telling me to do this? You know, he's 35 years old. He's LaMarcus Aldridge. He was once considered one of the biggest free agents of the offseason. I remember I wanted the Lakers to get him. But, and other than his leadership and his experience and his savviness as a veteran, he's still a very good passer. He could play the five. He could be a great post-passer. Um he tries on defense. He he's not that quick footed. He's not gonna be a lockdown defender, but he is still a good passer. If if I was to compare him to a player, I think he's he's maybe a better version of Marcus Saw for what the Lakers got Marcus Saw for. He's a good passer. He could still score. He could shoot the three sometimes. But I think Lamarcus Aldridge at this point in his career, he's probably a little bit better than Marcus Saw. Marcus Saw hasn't really worked out for the Lakers. And this just puts the Nets another level higher. I mean, they're already super stacked. KD, Kyrie, Harden, LaMarcus Aldridge, Blake Griffin, they are stacked. Um, we'll see how LaMarcus Aldridge keeps playing. Right now, uh, KD's out, Blake didn't play, and Harden is nursing a hammy. So it was only LaMarcus Aldridge, Kyrie, and the rest of the crew, and they still beat the Hornets pretty handily. So we'll see how they gel. But the Nets have a surplus of talent. They should be the the favorites for the title, not just to get out of the East, but to win the championship just by talent and alone. I know they have a rookie head coach, Steve Nash. He's a rookie head coach. We'll see how he performs under pressure in tough situations. Is he is he going to be able to call the timeouts at the right situation? Is he going to be able to you know rotate his players enough? Is he going to have the right adjustments the right plays out of timeouts we got to see how steve nash does that and we also got to see how this team gels like is their chemistry going to be a hundred percent like how is their chemistry going to be going into the playoffs um if if they have players out at different times how how many games are are they going to get under their belt where all five of them are there lamarcus aldridge um blake griffin kd Kyrie and Harden, how many games are they going to get together before the playoffs? So we got to consider that chemistry and how good of a coach Steve Nash is. But even if their chemistry is not the best, even if Steve Nash doesn't turn out to be a great coach or at least a great postseason coach, they have such an immense amount of talent in their roster that it shouldn't even matter. Like if, if their chemistry is not that good, if Steve Nash is not an elite coach, they just have so much talent that they should still be the perennial favorites for the NBA title, especially with AD and LeBron out. We got to see how they gel, how they come back. And the East just doesn't have horses to go up against the Nets. The Bucks, you know, we'll see what the Bucks do, but I don't think they have enough. The Sixers, they were a cool story. We'll see how Embiid comes back and if they're able to, you know, compete against the Nets, but they are the perennial favorites. Um, I know there's a lot of backlash for LaMarcus Aldridge for joining the Nets. They're calling it a weak move. They're saying that he should have gone somewhere else. I can see where people are coming, but I I don't really blame LaMarcus Aldridge. He's 35 years old. He's been the man with Portland, with San Antonio, and he just couldn't get it done. Uh, There's no shame in that. A lot of players just don't win a ring. Now he's 35 years old. He's on the back end of his career. He, he has this opportunity to get bought out, to be a free agent midseason and sign with the contender. I think the Nets are the most sure thing, as, as sure thing as you can get to like really make it to the finals. They're more of a sure thing than the Lakers just because the Clippers are on, in their way. We'll, we'll see what Utah does. We'll see how the West plays out. But the East, the East looks like it's the Nets and nobody else. Like if I'm being honest, like there's some good regular season games, but just the amount of talent that the Nets have is just, you can't ignore it. I would have loved LaMarcus Aldridge to go with the Heat. I think with 
with the trade for Oladipo and the way Jimmy Butler's playing and the way Bam has followed up his breakout season last year. If you add LaMarcus Aldridge to the five next to Bam and then you have Kyrie, I mean, you have Jimmy Butler and Oladipo and Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson, you have a squad, you could go back to the finals. He chose the Nets, and I can't be too mad. I can't be too mad at him. Like, go get that ring, man. You've been an All Star. You've been a great player. Like, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Go get your ring. I kind of wanted him with the with the Lakers too, but it wasn't it wasn't meant to be. He didn't end up with the Lakers, and now he's the Nets. So we'll see we'll see how this plays out. Uh, the Nets definitely have a lot of pressure. Um, they were, they already had so much pressure when it was just Kyrie Harden. And Kyrie, Kyrie, KD, and Harding, Harden, they already had so much pressure once they made that trade for Harden. Now they get LaMarcus Aldridge. Now they get um, Blake Griffin by the buyout market. That's just added pressure. Like the Nets, like it would be, it would be insane if the Nets don't make the finals. Like I can't, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it in a way. I'm, I'm not a Nets fan. I'm a Lakers fan. So I, like it would be. Like the same way that people bash the Clippers for not making the uh, Western Conference Finals last year, it would be like that, but just times a hundred. If the Nets don't at least make it to the finals, it would just be a, Twitter will have a field day with them. I know all these major networks will have a big field day if the Nets don't make the finals. So I'm kind of hoping it happens, but I also I would like to see a KD versus. Um, LeBron final just to for them to duke it out again while they're still in their prime. KD he came back from his Achilles. He's definitely in his prime. We'll see how many years LeBron still has of his prime, but I need to see that matchup in the finals while they're still at a very elite level. But Lamarcus Aldridge can't be mad at you for signing with the Nets. Uh, I can't wish you the best because I am a Lakers fan and I'm hoping for the repeat. But I do wish you you know well with the Nets. And to end this podcast, let's end it on a sad note. The U.S. men's national team fails to fail to man. I can't even talk because I'm so upset. The U.S. men's national team fails to make the Olympics one more time. They have not made the Olympics since 2008. This is the third straight cycle that they have not made the Olympics. The last time they made it was in 08. It's been 13 years now, and it would be 17 years by the time. They have a chance to make it again. It's just unacceptable. The Olympics is the second most important competition in soccer. It's the World Cup. And then it's the Olympics. And then maybe the Euros or the Confederation Cup. One of those two as, as importance. But it is what it is. The U.S. men's national team did not make it again. I think it's time. It's been time for us to rethink the system that the U.S. is running need better coaches. We need a better youth program. Um, it can't be the same as all the other years. You would think that after they missed the 2012 Olympics, they would have taken a hard look at themselves and, and said, hey, this is not working. We got to change it up. And then they didn't qualify in 2016. And you would think that would be the turning point. If it wasn't in 12, it would be in 16. And nothing changed. And now it happens again. So, you know, Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And right now, the U.S. men's national team program is insane because they're not really changing anything. They're doing the same thing over and over again, and they're expecting different results. And if they don't do anything, we're going to keep missing the Olympics. Um, we're going to keep missing World Cups, and the U.S. is never going to progress. And I know a lot of people are excited because of the senior team. We have Pulisic. We have Dest. We have players playing in important teams, Chelsea, Barcelona, Valencia, um, Manchester City. You have Stefan being the backup keeper for Manchester City. You have Reyna with Borussia Dortmund. There's so much optimism in the U.S. men's national team. But then you have these collapses. You have these bad black marks on the U.S. men's national team history that you just can't have especially in the CONCACAF region no offense to the CONCACAF but it is one of the weakest regions of soccer it's U.S. Mexico Costa Rica sometimes and that's it all these other countries my respects to them I'm impressed by how Honduras played um, they played with heart they played with determination they left it all out on the field and that's what the U.S. needs 
Shout out to Honduras. They've made the, like, the last few Olympics. It looks like they have something going on over there. But the amount of money that the U.S. has, the amount of infrastructure that the U.S. has, they should never be missing the Olympics. They should never be missing the um, World Cup. And it just keeps on happening. So I think one of the main problems that the U.S. has is their youth system. Uh, they charge a lot of money to have kids play. So it kind of funnels out a lot of the talent because they can't afford to play. And you lose a lot of your talent pool that way. I think they need to look at teams in Europe and the Netherlands and, and England and Spain and how their system is different. Um, they have they build their youth system up and then they make their mo- they make their profit selling those players when they become pros, when when they reach their potential. I think that's the system that the U.S. has to implement, like make your money, you know, really honing players talent and then they become pros and you ship them off to Europe or you. Uh, a big team comes and gets them from you, and now you make a big profit off that player instead of just charging the kid from the time he could play, like five years old till he turns 18, and you milk that cow from for 13 years, but your program as a whole is not going anywhere. And if things like this don't change, we're going to be in the same cycle. It doesn't matter how many talented players come and make the senior team. If we don't have the right coaches, if there's not players in the U.S. men's national team that really feel the jersey, that really want to leave it all on the field for the U.S. men's national team, then the U.S. men's national team is never going to go anywhere. And it's just unacceptable to miss the Olympics three straight years. The Olympics, everybody watches the Olympics. Everybody knows how important the Olympics is. And if I was just to make a comparison, the the Mexican Olympic team missed out on the 2008 Olympics. And four years later, they made the Olympics and they won gold. They won gold at, in the Olympics in England. I believe it was London. London 2012. They missed the 2008. I mean, they missed the 2008 Olympics. Four years later, they came back with the vengeance and they won gold. Why can't the U.S. have that mentality? Why couldn't they... After they missed the 2012 Olympics and they saw their neighbors, Mexico, win the Olympics in 2012, why why couldn't that be what made them, you know, flip the switch in their head and be like, OK, we missed the Olympics. Our neighbors just won it. Like, let's really build this program and put emphasis on, you know, raising our young players and being a competitive team. But they haven't. And now it's the second, third time we miss the Olympics. Uh, something needs to change. And I don't know if they're just being, they don't care. Uh, I think for one of the problems is that because the uh, U.S. men's national team doesn't get the media attention, doesn't have um, these big channels covering soccer because U.S. soccer is at best the fourth most popular sport in the U.S. When the U.S. men's national team fail to accomplish their goals, when they miss the World Cup, when they miss the Olympics, the mass mass media is not there to hold them accountable. It's not there to criticize them. It's not there to um, really highlight their um, their deficits, their lack of accomplishments. And whoever's on top, whoever's leading this program, just faces no repercussions. He just gets to keep going on and on. So it's a it's a vicious cycle because if the U.S. men's national team doesn't succeed, then the the big media won't cover them. But if they if they have trouble succeeding, if they don't accomplish their goals, then the big media is not going to cover them. No one's going to hold these people accountable. They're not going to change. So they're not going to get the attention. It's just a vicious cycle. I just hope the U.S. men's national team, the program, the U.S. soccer program improves in these next four years and the U.S. returns to the Olympics in 2024. But that is it for this episode of the Hard to Handle Sports Podcast. Um Thank you so much if you were here till the end, if you listen to the end. Episode 41 will be coming out Sunday night or Monday night. I will be recording with my friend Matt and Jason. They've both been on the podcast before. Matt has been on the podcast the last, I believe he's been on it four times. Jason has been on it one time. Uh, We're going to link up on Sunday and record. Talk Talk a bunch of soccer, football, basketball. We might even talk some baseball. Baseball season kicked off yesterday. Shout out to the Padres. This is the best roster they had in a while, so I'm very excited to see how they finish. Hopefully they win the World Series, they win the championship for San Diego, but we'll see how the MLB season plays out. But stay tuned for episode 41, probably dropping Sunday night or Monday night, and have a good 
rest of your day.